Hello, uh, this is Katarzyna Grabska and I'm uh, happy to uh, be here with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to share some final reflections on these very rich discussions and exchanges that we've had uh, the pleasure to listen to and take part in over the past uh, four weeks. Um, these points uh, of connect uh, have offered an opportunity to encounter artists, theorists, researchers and humanitarians uh, who reflected on the connection between art and humanity and what are the possibilities. So the participants were asked to respond to some of the key themes uh, that were posed in the call for papers. And some of them, the fundamental beings, uh, can art enable us to grasp with the current humanitarian and conflict related complexities and give them meaning? Um, can works of art that address humanitarian issues help us achieve a more nuanced and concrete understanding of these issues? How can we ensure that representations of these issues betray neither the people that are affected by them nor the situations themselves? And finally, can, uh, what can artistic imagination do when that of a whole people is reduced to ruins? Can the artist play the role of a mediator? And I think the last presentation of um, uh, uh, Luis Tovar, Carlos Tovar that we've just watched speaks directly to that issue. In what way an artist offers so many possibilities of um, not being just an artist, but going beyond that in the context of humanitarian settings. So we listen to this presentation that engage consecutively with the following themes. Learning from art, that was um, day one. Engaging on day two representation on day three, and today uh, we'll listen to how art is impacting. So day one offered uh, us presentations that focused on what we can learn from art itself. And I remember uh, watching that day and being really impressed by what Ariana Kirk, uh, while she was discussing the exhibition Real Feelings, the artist as visionary, made us think about made us reflect on the concept of artists as radical agents in the current context of biotech surveillance. Uh, Francesco Tuconi, on the other hand, offered a reflection on using Caravaggio's paintings uh, for humanitarian communication as a metaphor of displacing not only art, but also its use in the humanitarian visual culture and how appropriate or ethically problematic that might be. And then we listened to Olivier Cho, who discussed art uh, that can represent wider issues without uh, producing artwork about genocide um, and at the same time uh, not opening, reopening the wood and, and producing a spectacle of suffering, but uh, looking at the work of um, Antonio Jazz, how he deals with, uh, uh, with the Rwandan genocide. They too uh, produced a series of very interesting uh, interventions that had to do with engagement. And it offered reflections of engagement and how art and art-based projects in the context of humanitarian settings can play an important role in healing, reconciliation, memorialization, and coming to terms with conflicts and crises. As Sofia Milosevic, Azadeh Stabud, and Elodie Payard all stressed, they stressed the importance of putting the affected individuals and their voices at the center of these art-based projects, whether they are memorialization projects, reconciliations, and healing practices, thus providing an arena for sharing their stories and healing communities. And I think the work of Luis uh, Carlos Tovar spoke to these issues uh, very clearly today as well. This, uh, this approach might uh, just offer a way to go beyond the individual towards the community, a more collective space to memorize otherwise. On day three, we looked at representation. And the key issues discussed on the day were around the problems and problematics of representation, as well as ethics of cultural work. Uh, Dominique uh, Lalegue, Marc Herbst, and Isabelle Delacour showed how complex the issues of representations are as related to art and artistic projects. But at the same time, uh, what are also the pitfalls of looking at art as a neutral process? practice that is decontextualized and disconnected from time and place that it actually took place in, especially in the context of human suffering. So they also stress the importance of working from local knowledges, experiences, 
beyond and against voyeuristic and Western humanitarian gaze that it's that has been so problematic in in the humanitarian uh, practice and in the humanitarian uh, industry, if, if we can say that, towards a more co-constructed and community-owned approach to ethical cultural work. And for example, the discussion of using chair as a metaphor that embodies the absence the invisible people, and at the same time, the social and human connections through the act of remembering collectively was a magnificent example that artists have produced in numerous settings to reflect on, uh, on issues of uh, suffering, of, uh, of uh, violence, of war, without bringing the uh, particular individual um, and without, without producing a particular story. And today on day four, we'll, we engaged with impacting. And the speakers today offered some insights on, uh, first of all, transformative uh, uh, learning, how interaction with art can produce also transformative learning at the more individual uh, level, and then possibly also at the communal level. Um, how that produces both a transformation for as participants in, in, in the art projects. And, and some of it was exposed in the presentation by Luis Carlos Lovar, uh, talking about different projects of memorization, of understanding conflict, of coming from the individual to the collective process of coming to terms with violence, um, conflict, war, disappearance, remembering otherwise. They've also reflected, and I think this is the intervention of the humanitarian of uh, Paola, uh, on the way art can also help uh, humanitarians to think differently about the work that they do with their sort of community-based uh, protection approach that has been now promoted in the humanitarian settings um, and working, uh, understanding the more uh, art-based community approach and therefore improving humanitarian responses. So in the next few minutes, I wanted to reflect on some of the issues that were raised in these discussions, as well as offer some insights based on my, on my own work as an anthropologist and researcher and a collaborator in, a, in artistic projects. I worked a lot in, in uh, conflict areas and, and with displaced populations, and also with artists who live in these situations, but also with artists who work with those issues. Um, Artists play a central role in periods of uncertainty and volatility, both as commentators of events and as inspirators for change. So as Bell and Desai argued, the arts are a particularly potent way to activate imagination and a broader understanding of injustice, its consequences and the range of alternative possibilities. In general, art plays a formative role in the constitution of social life, in the ways in which people take responsibility for creating their own histories, for participating in the management of their own social and political realities. And that's a quote from uh, Hebel. Here, I, but I also think the older artists and, and uh, researchers and presenters who spoke in this symposium, uh, see, engage with art and see art both uh, as political and critical. So that, that's the type of art that, uh, that we are engaging with here in this discussion. It's not all art uh, plays this role, even though art is always political. Um, as Müller argues, art is political if it complicates, not simplifies, and if it extends the threat of recognition and understanding beyond what previously was seen and known. These reinterpretations help reveal existing power relations within society, determining what previously was known and what was deemed worthy of creative exploration in the first place, and identifying what previously was not seen and therefore not known, including identification of what should be seen or known. So, while artists may, uh, may also attempt to contribute to political change, very often, and work towards uh, social change in the society, uh, they often also uh, work uh, towards, they work in pair with the political authorities and sort of uh, in, in, in the way of um, uh, reconstituting 
of uh, what it is uh, national, what it is uh, societal, what it is the kind of propaganda, uh, propaganda way uh, of the political regimes. Therefore, we have to see art as something that can work on different spectrums, not only as a panacea for social justice, not all ja art. Uh, refers to the type of social justice that uh, that is being promoted also through the humanitarian uh, work. Um, critical art, at the same time, as defined by uh, Jacques Rancière, is an art that aims to produce a new perception of the world and therefore create a commitment to its transformation. And I think this is also the art that we are talking about uh, here in this symposium. Some creative practice creates ruptures when it introduces new sensations, ideas, and forms of life to people's perceptions and experiences, broadening the nature of societal and political discourses. For the artist, an art to be engaged in transformative processes, the art needs to penetrate the veneer of certainty in a dominant social order, to open up a different way of seeing. And according to Rancière, this is a relational process where the artist, the art, and the audience work out meanings through co-creative practice. So uh, now I'll summarize the three main points offered uh, uh, that I will offer here. Uh, hopefully they will be uh, useful to reflect and refocus our debate on art, artists, and humanitarians or humanity, uh, as we have done over the past four sessions. And first I focus on the role of artists and art in the context of humanitarian settings. So artistic expressions can have a wide range of functions for the individual and for the collectives in society, not least during violent conflict and oppression. Artists play a central role in periods of uncertainty and liminality as commentators of events, producers of particular certainties through folklore and propaganda, but also as inspirators for change. Uh, as I said, National governments, uh, they are very happy to use also artists uh, uh, and, and promote certain type of art to, to, to confirm uh, their political uh, goals and, and, and discourses and kind of rebuild ideas of what national culture is and identity. Yet art, and I think all the artists that we've listened to in this symposium, um, the art that they've engaged with, is also a space of for resistance and resilience during the times of repression and conflict and kind of humanitarian settings. And this is where our interest lies, really. Um, as much as these themes of resistance and resilience are complicated and problematic and contested. Creative practice may also provide the space for individual and collective self-expression. And I think that's important to remember. Um, it is, it is that also came the discussion of Paula uh, today, who was talking about different ways of viewing the everyday life in the situation of humanitarian settings. The life continues otherwise. It is not only about crisis and suffering. There are also joys, there are also births, there are also marriages, there's, there's also divorces, there's also uh, celebrations, and there's also crying. So uh, it is important that we also document those moments and artists are very good at doing that, seeing the, 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 little, the little things of everyday life they make, that make the whole. Uh, so it may be seen as the only space open for resistance in repressive contexts or the best way to bring marginalization and injustice into focus. It can contribute to the process of individual and collective coming to terms with human consequences of violent conflict, displacement, war, genocide, and so on. But it is also Im important to remember that there is this aesthetic nature of art, even in the context of humanitarian settings. And there's also an importance of creating art for its own sake, for the artistic sake. And I think what is interesting to, to note is that um, in, the 60, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, uh, to be called the polit to, to be uh, an artist who was called a political artist or doing political art was highly problematic. Uh, whereas now for many artists uh, to prove that they just do art is actually highly problematic because highly, highly difficult because very often uh, we tend to um, politicize um, all different types of uh, artistic responses um, in the contemporary art practice. But it is important to remember that in the context of humanitarian settings or, or humanitarian situations, producing 
beauty through art, it's also a form of uh, living in the conflict. So for example, in, in the context of Sarajevo, um, uh, one of the musicians who played on the ruins uh, uh, of the city, uh, they said, you know, music reminds us that there is life beyond war, humanity beyond degradation, beauty beyond ugliness. Therefore, creative black practice is also for many a way of life in violent conflict and displacement, a way to deal with it, to live through it. Now I turn to point number two, uh, art and artists as transformers, and we talked about it especially, especially today, uh, the kind of impact that they might produce. Um, while art opens many possibilities of knowing, provoking and challenging, uh, its transformative powers, even though they might be quite powerful at the individual level, at the structural level, I think at the societal level, they're much more problematic and overstated. The change doesn't happen only through, uh, through, through art, unfortunately. It has to happen in, in dialogue with other uh, structures of power. And I think this is where the link with humanitarian settings is extremely important with humanitarian organizations that very often have that power to negotiate certain changes um, in the society. Um, this assumption about artists as transformers and art as transformative uh, also assumes in a certain way that all of us have the same capacity as audience and the same savoir faire to read art in the same way. What is however powerful about art is its endless possibilities of interpretation. And these interpretations come from the situated knowledge of each of us as a spectator, as an audience, as a reader, as a viewer, as someone who experiences the art, through, seen through the social and cultural frames that shaped our identities and ways of seeing, feeling, and experiencing art. Um, another question is, what type of transformation do we imagine when we talk about art? as a transfer, transformative potential. Artistic practices has a great potential to relate to space and time and transform them both. But how to transform uh, the structures of power that actually very often are the causes of, uh, of humanitarian uh, suffering, of humanitarian crisis, of conflicts and so on. So that, that cannot I argue that that has to be, there has to be an perspective. So just to uh, um, go to point number three, which is the link between humanitarianism and art, but also the, the danger of using art and the danger of representation in the humanitarian context. So we see between humanitarianism and this critical and political art that we've talked about, they both deal with human values, with issues that refer to humanity, with universal values that relate to what humanity is. And in this way, the two are linked as having often at its core humanity rather than individual dimension. Art and humanitarians are at the same time both also not neutral. They are both political fields and take place within concrete political contexts. They are also influenced and thus transformed by these complex contexts. Therefore, while some artists might be radical agents for change, they are far from floating agents. I think uh, um, uh, Anika Khan uh, talked about this kind of possibility of artists as floating um, uh, apolitical and having this total freedom. But the reality of it is that their art is also produced in these very concrete settings that are driven by money, by politics, by economic interests, uh, uh, by influence, by privilege. Third point, the link between humanitarianism and art, both art and humanitarianism have to do with representation and the complexities of this. And we've discussed it at length. Who has a voice to speak on behalf of whom? Who can represent whom and in what way? And both contemporary art and humanitarianism have opened up the participatory processes and practices, community-based protection, for example, or participatory art projects, co-creation of cultural work, to overcome some of the perils of representation. But I think there is more uh, that we can learn, uh, especially from the artistic uh, practice of doing this. So some dangers in using art in humanitarian settings as our contributors to this symposium warned us. 
And I think we have to keep them in mind when we talk about the possibilities. Um, humanitarian contexts have responded to great potential of art as a healing tool. However, uh, this is a sort of a reductionist and utilitarian view of art and using it in, in, uh, in a given context as a remedy. So we have to think wider than that. Art is not only for, for healing, but it has all these other uh, aspects of creative imagination and knowing otherwise. So why there is a need to rethink the role of arts in addressing and representing humanitarian disaster, the challenges and obstacles facing the work of art in humanitarian contexts, and the role of art in contributing to the long-term process of transforming relationships, healing wounds, seeking justice, and fostering human flourishing need to be carefully considered. Often art and artists in humanitarian settings or in those in conflict situations who have faced oppression and violence, see art as a way to exist, a way to stay alive, a way to stay hum human in such extremely dehumanizing conditions. And for me, I think what, is, um, what it shows is the skull of artists and art, and I would stress that, as the quest for ethics of recognition through artistic practice. Um, Therefore, there is a need for this ethical response that recognizes the subjects that are narrating these accounts. The ethical response that comes from the humanitarian setting, but also from the humanitarian organizations, but also those uh, in positions of power that are causing uh, such humanitarian disasters. So to conclude, what are the possibilities? What are the points of reflection and refocusing? As one of the contributors to the symposium said, art is seen very often as non-essential, but therefore is essential. And the power of art to capture the otherwise invisible, to imagine the impossible, and to, to, to really uh, live in the humanity, in the sea of humanity, as Paula said, and as Luis Carlos Tovar also emphasized in his talk uh, today, that art cannot be separated from humanity. Art can offer a room for reflection and refocusing of ideas, ways of being and connecting particular events to wider moral and societal values and norms. It is a way to comment on the society and offers a critical stance. It opens up a space of knowing otherwise through different senses, not only through the sight. And this is sort of against the enlightenment uh, debate of uh, artists as visionaries. But in terms of uh, uh, going beyond the vision, uh, work that engages a multiplicity of senses, not just sight, including all the five senses to trigger our intuition, our minds, our imaginations. This can offer a different way of knowing and a different way of addressing issues related to human tiredness. In this way, art can potentially offer what, uh, what in today's presentation, Aspen uh, called transformative learning. Again, this transformative learning does not take place in the apolitical uh, situation. Um, and art is not an apolitical solution uh, in itself. Uh, and therefore, artists should not be seen as the substitutes of humanitarian workers. Their role in the society, in many ways, is very different than that of artists. Neither art nor humanitarian work work are apolitical, as we said, and they take place in concrete settings and contexts. But these contexts need to be considered when the transformative learning is taken from the individual to the societal and then um, structural levels. Yet art has a role in the society, but it cannot substitute the role of the state, responsibilities towards the elevation of suffering and resolution of conflicts. And it should neither be seen as a tool to achieve that, in this way, we risk to strip, in a sense, the, the, on the one hand, the artists from their own sense of creative selves and put a large burden on them in res resolving these very complicated issues. Um, but also uh, reduce the opportunities that we have uh, in wider possibilities of interpretation in artistic work, in wider possibilities of imagining. So I think what is key is uh, how through art and, and, and linking it to the humanitarian settings, we can 
produce, engage, we can engage otherwise, learn otherwise, remember otherwise, imagine otherwise, and potentially lead to a change. In change that the change that has to come in a dialogue uh, between artists and humanitarians, but also uh, also the, the authorities and, and wider societal institutions. Um, it has to come also from the co-production of knowledge and this and the great potential uh, to offer a different type of reading, feeling, experiencing art, not only to open the wounds, but also uh, how to go beyond um, visual representation of suffering. To imagine alternatives, I think that's a great potential of art for humanitarians. But it is also linked to the responsibility of humanitarian organizations, as well as the states, that cannot be replaced by the artistic practice. So I'll finish here, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.